Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to be here with you for this third edition of uh, the annual online conference on wetlands restoration together with our mad wet uh, colleagues. I'd like uh, indeed to remind that um, for this uh, edition, the focus will be indeed on the development so far. We have been trying over the past year to raise uh, awareness about uh, the importance of the Mediterranean uh, wetlands uh, to raise the polo, uh, profile uh, uh, at uh, uh, policy and uh, uh, political uh, level, and a lot has been uh, happening. So in today's edition, we will actually wrap up on uh, all uh, uh, this, um, indeed what has happened within the UFM uh, uh, frame, uh, the 43 Euro Mediterranean countries and related decision also within uh, the Greener Med agenda, so the environment agenda of the Union for the Mediterranean. We will hear more what has happened very importantly at the level of Ramsar, also through the decision taken at COP14, at COP23 of the Barcelona Convention and COP28, uh, which just closed. We have with uh, us today also the UFM uh, co-presidency, so uh, the European co-presidency with uh, Mr. Patrick Beger from the International Relation of DG Environment, as well as Mr. Abdella Al Sud who is uh, the director of the Ministry of Environment of uh, Jordan. So together with me, they will open uh, this uh, uh, edition. We um, have been over the past years also been um, preparing some uh, material uh, for uh, policy making, trying to, uh, let's say, sum in um, dedicated targeted documents, the main information for uh, the best use of uh, the valuable uh, um, knowledge uh, uh, collected and experience collected around uh, wetlands and in particular in the Mediterranean. And this goes along also with the publication of uh, the first, let's call the IPCC report for the Mediterranean, also the MEDEC report, which is now uh, going into some, uh, uh, let's say, more uh, specialized and focus uh, edition one of which is going to be very soon on uh, coastal uh, erosion. I'd like to make also a bit of housekeeping without taking uh, any further time. Namely, I kindly ask uh, to all the speakers to stay by the time, set in the agenda. You know, this is an online conference. Uh, we have interpretation and we need to stay within, let's say, the timing uh, uh, frame. There will be also a room for questions and answers. And uh, for doing so, please uh, use uh, the chat. Our colleagues are here to uh, answer to any of the questions uh, uh, raised. So without any further ado, let me pass the floor to my colleague Patrick Egert uh, from uh, DG Environment. Patrick, the floor is yours. Patrick? Maybe Patrick is still not connected, and if and yes, he's no, here. He's here. He's here, right? So, Patrick, can you hear us? Yes. Yes. I can see you now. Apologies. Please, yeah, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Alessandra. Good morning. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me to this. Um, this important meeting uh, on, on wetlands. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Patrick Wigert. Uh, I work at DG Environment uh, of the European Commission, and we are, um, along with Jordan, then co-hosts of uh, the UFM, and work very closely with uh, Alessandra and her colleagues on, um, on all issues related to environment um, in the UFM region, um, so both environment and water. Um, this morning, I'll be very brief because I, I I want to allow the the, the event to, to take place and apologies for the for the delay in joining you. Um, I think uh, there are just two points when we're talking, I think from the Commission's point of view um, and from the EU's point of view, when we're talking about the wetlands, the importance of wetlands, I think there are two points I'd really un, uh, like to underline before the, the start of the meeting. Um, firstly, is obviously the commitments that um, the EU, the member states, the UFM member states, 
gave um, last year, almost a, a year ago at Montreal um, for the Global Biodiversity Framework uh, under the Convention on Biological Diversity, the UN Convention. Um, so these were what are supposed to be a, a, a ambitious but achievable targets uh, on protecting and restoring biodiversity. And uh, wetlands play a very key role in that uh, in that area. So I think this will be a this will be a very big challenge for us in the coming years, well, currently and also moving forward, both to protect the, the wetland areas and also to restore them. Um, at EU level, you may be aware we have legislation uh, that's in its final stages, what well, has recently recently been adopted for um, the restoration of wetland areas, um, what restoration of biodiversity, including their wetland areas. And there's this target of having 30% of, uh, of both land and sea areas under some type of protection. Um, so I think both protection and restoration will be key and uh, are clearly um, very significant when we're looking at the role of wetlands in protecting and restoring biodiversity. And the second point uh, I'd just like to highlight, um, particularly as we've just had, um, again, at international level, we've had the UNFCCC COP28 meeting uh, in Dubai, which was uh, finalized uh, earlier on this week. Um, and that's really obviously the role of wetlands, the wetlands play in um, adapting to and adapting and mitigating um, climate change uh, in the region. The region, as we know, is, is one of the most uh, highly affected by changes in climate it's it's seen significant changes in in, in temperature um uh, and there i think i would emphasize the the, the importance the wetlands play in 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 um as i said in in both adapting and mitigating to climate change and um, this is linked clearly um with the the need to protect them as we say um biodiversity uh, and climate change are two sides of the same coin and i think when we're looking at the context of wetlands, that the, that's made very, very clear. Um, so I think that's, uh, from my side, just to give a brief overview of where we are from the EU, and I think um, how we view the importance of wetlands, particularly in the Mediterranean region. Um, and from that side, then I pass the floor back to Alessandra. Thank you. Many thanks, Patrick, for indeed uh, connecting the dots with the Global Biodiversity Framework with a very important nature restoration law that we all hope is going to be, let's say, um, finalized and completed very soon. And uh, uh, indeed, uh, uh, with the um, uh, situation in the Mediterranean, uh, we know that it's uh, one of the regions that is uh, uh, warming fast, uh, say, at world level, I mean, 20% uh, faster than the global average. And of course, this is a very uh, scary and alarming, uh, um, you know, data that uh, we have all to keep uh, in mind uh, in acting uh, promptly and effectively also through um, this work on wetlands. So let me now pass the floor to our uh, colleague, Abdella Alziud, the director of uh, uh, the Ministry of Environmental Jordan. Abdella, the floor is yours. Yes, you hearing me? Yeah, we can hear you very well. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, it is an honor to be taking part of this third online uh, conference on the uh, restoration of the Mediterranean wetland, wetland-based solution. I had the pleasure to welcome the first conference on wetland restoration as a natural-based solution in the Mediterranean uh, on behalf of the Jordan co-presidency in 2021. Uh, it is truly uh, remarkable the momentum that natural-based solution as a whole and the wetland is particular have again ever science. Uh, back in the day, the conference focused on the most efficient tools to restore wetlands and relevant restoration projects. Now we are able to provide you with an overview of the many advancements done for a global perspective to the commercial local dimension with example uh, also in the South Mediterranean. During the COP28 in Dubai, we have seen the, that the, the need to protect and restore the key ecosystem, such as wetland, even more urgent. They are centered 
to mitigation and adaptation to climate change. And they must be higher up the agenda than ever before. Therefore, now it is time to act and implement solution based on wetland to tackle the pricing environment and the climate challenges. This is a great opportunity for the Mediterranean region to continue to join forces toward a sustainable and inclusive economy preserving in our invaluable ecosystem. We, we hope to support the process by introducing you there to here today, not only the latest tools to support wetland restoration and conservation, but also new partnership and opportunities for funding wetland-based solutions. The successful story that will be present, present today confirm that putting the focus on local skill can help achievement a great benefit for wetlands in the Mediterranean. The successful stories, sorry, moreover, investing in the restoration of Mediterranean wetlands can play a key role in uh, tackling the consequences of the climate change in the Mediterranean. Uh, and final, I would like to uh, mention that the process is initiated today also aliens with the first, the joint flagship UFM 2030 Green, Green Mid Agenda, the UFM Ministerial Declaration on Environment and the Climate Change, achievement of the environmental SDGs in the Mediterranean, with the Ramsar Convention and their COP14 resolutions, the COP15 on biodiversity, and the most recent COP28, as the, as the colleagues will explain. And final, I want to thank you very much for joining today, and I wish you a truly fruitful, successful meeting. Thank you. Many thanks, Abdallah. Many thanks for accommodating, actually, your participation today. I know you're running from one meeting to another, uh, so it wasn't the best day for you, but thank you very much for uh, being uh, with us. And indeed, I mean, uh, supporting and giving also the vision from uh, the, the South. I'd like also to recall and maybe also to pick on some of your words. Indeed, uh, you mentioned solution, you mentioned uh, environmental services tools, and these are all topics that we are going to go more in depth during the course of this uh, event. So without any further ado, let me give uh, the floor um, for an overview, let's say, from the global to the local to uh, context to the Ramsar uh, Secretariat, to Ms. Flor Lafayette de Michaud, I hope uh, actually I pronounce it well, and to Marianne uh, Kouroble from uh, MedWet, uh, that uh, of course uh, we know from the very previous edition. Thank you very much, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alessandra. I hope you all hear me well. So I'm very pleased to be here for, with you today. Thank you for UFM and MedWet for inviting us I mean, for us, it's really uh, great to see the tremendous efforts from uh, MedWet and also from UFM towards uh, the wetlands uh, in the region. It's, um, you know, as the uh, negotiations were just uh, out from the COP28, um, I, it was a great pleasure to see again this water-related ecosystem being highlighted in the discussions, and I will come back to this later. But let me first maybe quickly uh, introduce or reintroduce the Convention on Wetlands. You know, we are the oldest and we can say the most experienced MEA. Uh, we, I mean, the, the agreement was adopted in 1917 in uh, Ramsa city of Iran, and we now count 172 parties to the Convention. Our, our mission is globally to um, ensure the protection, conservation, and wise use of wetlands through international, but also national and local actions. Uh, the convention hosts a network of what we call Ramsar sites or wetlands of international importance that count 2,500 wetlands. And that represents globally more than 250 million of hectares. So I would like now to uh, quickly uh, recall you the next, uh, sorry, the past steps that have been so important uh, for restoration of wetlands. It was already highlighted uh, by uh, Mr. Patrick Begert uh, on the global biodiversity framework, the targets two and three for conservation, restoration and conservation. 
uh, but it was also um, very much importantly raised at the COP28. And here I want to uh, mention the freshwater challenge uh, that had been an important um, event in, in the COP28 um, that saw 38 countries making pledges for restoring wetlands, rivers and wetlands. And so let me maybe uh, have a, a few words uh, further on this freshwater challenge that was launched by, uh, this is a country-led initiative led by Colombia, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ecuador, Gabon, Mexico, Zambia, at the UN 2023 Water Conference as part of the Water Action Agenda. And these country, and now these 38 countries, recently uh, pledges for addressing the wetlands restoration gaps by protecting and restoring 300,000 kilometers of rivers and 350 million uh, hectares of wetlands. That represents roughly the 30% of degraded freshwater ecosystems, including inland and coastal waters. And this really speaks to the target two of the global biodiversity framework. So this uh, will act as an umbrella for this restoration of, of wetlands. And what we would like to see uh, is to see this momentum continuing throughout 2024 up to the COP29 in, in Azerbaijan. Um, you know also that there will be an important um, milestone also at COP15 in Zimbabwe, the COP15 of the Ramsar Convention in Zimbabwe. And we would like to invite all interested countries, and I, I hope that we will be able to count on uh, Mediterranean countries to propose a draft resolution towards further restoration of wetlands uh, by the region. We have already, and it has been mentioned, a very important resolution, uh, thanks to Medwet's initiative at COP14 that uh, linked with nature-based solutions and ecosystem-based approaches for more restoration of wetlands. So I would like now to give the floor to Marianne to uh, let you know about uh, the uh, regional uh, EU and also regional um, progress that has been uh, happening so far. So Marian, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Flo. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, UFM, and particularly, particularly Francesca for co-hosting this event. Uh, I, I'm going to go um, to give you some update on the legal and policy framework uh, at the Mediterranean level, and especially at the Barcelona Convention. Um, Metwit was present there, the, the last COP uh, happened last week in Slovenia. And uh, I want to raise the fact that in fact, uh, wetlands are gaining more and more traction in this, uh, in this forum at the Barcelona Convention. So first of all, uh, there was the presentation of the medic report that Francesca mentioned, and they really, really raised the, the agency to act for wetlands. Uh, because these um, ecosystems, particularly on the coastal area, are continuing to be degraded and and undermanaged, and the situation is so alarming that even the 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 great function of uh, mitigating and adapting to climate change is is threatened. And um, so the the medic report is really raising the urgency to act. To, uh, to to protect and restore uh, Mediterranean wetlands, and especially on the coastal areas, we we are at the stage where we we with climate change, the ninety five percent of coastal wetlands are at risk of uh, disappearing because of uh, sea level rises, and fifty thousand uh, bird species that are hosted in these wetlands. So the situation is dramatic and. And uh, so uh, there was uh, quite a few commitments that were taken at this uh, COP. Uh, first of all, the, there was a ministerial declaration where the parties to the convention uh, committed to, um, to protect uh, coastal and marine ecosystem, uh, uh, to stick to the GBF, so 30% of, of this area will be uh, under protection by 2030. And they also committed to um, uh, to add the degradation, the degradation of this uh, fragile ecosystem. 
They also committed to um, uh, to effectively effectively um, put in practice uh, the the two main um, uh, policy framework of this convention, which is the the new biodiversity framework on biodiversity, which is uh, precisely referring to wetland restoration and also the integrated coastal zone management protocol, which is also a, a vital uh, legal instrument. So, but beyond these uh, commitments, uh, what is really at stake is, is the, the survival and the resilience of the, the coastal uh, communities, because a third of the median uh, population live on the coast, coastal areas. The, also the economies are threat and, and 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 of course the biodiversity. So it's really, really a question of uh, uh, urgency. And Floor mentioned the very important issue of water. Water is is also wetlands, and it is a big issue in the Mediterranean area. Uh, so coming back now to to the EU, uh, Patrick also mentioned, of course, the the last development regarding the uh, the EU restoration law. Maybe I'm going to give you a bit more uh, further elements on that. So. Uh, so the EU restoration law is a new binding instrument uh, at the EU level, but there's already a lot of uh, of uh, uh, legal framework at the EU level uh, addressing that the, all the directive or habitat, the uh, bird directive, directive, um, the EU strategy on biodiversity, the flood directive, and so on. There's, uh, but so this restoration law is is was. Uh, to provide a specific um, legal text for the restoration of at least originally uh, to restore 20% of EU land, coastal marine and freshwater habitat, including floodplains and, and peatlands by 2030. So what happened, there was this negotiation process started quite a while ago. And uh, this summer, there was a big debate at the European Parliament with a bit of uh, uh, watering down of the objectives and target of this uh, of this law, uh, but what what happened also there was uh, quite of the requirements to prevent the deterioration of ecosystem was also a bit watered down, but what what we can return which is quite positive is there still is some very high restoration targets for farmlands, drain peatlands, and also for free flowing rivers. So this is quite, uh, we, we have to, to be positive. So what is the next step for this uh, restoration rule? So there's going to be a discussion and adoption in March 2024 by the European Parliament and then the Council. So we hope it's going to give uh, a, a new uh, focus on, on the importance of, of wetlands for the for the resilience of, of, of uh, biodiversity and people in, in Europe and especially in the Mediterranean region. Thank you. Many thanks, many thanks Flora and uh, Marianna for this um, very important overview on the situation at uh, global and uh, Mediterranean level. Thank you also for referring to the challenge and introducing new elements in our debate including also, you know, uh, the progress uh, that um, is going to, you know, uh, be looked for and uh, hopefully achieve also a COP15. Uh, and thank you very much also, Marianne, for the reflection on the nature restoration law that we indeed all hope is going to go through and with the maximum, let's say, ambition, uh, let's say, reachable in terms of compromise. So I will now um, suggest to launch uh, uh, the video on the Garamel um, wetland in Tunisia, and immediately after that, we launch uh, session one. Please. C'est notre vie, c'est euh, on inspire euh, de là, de la terre, de la lagune, du lac et tout. Hein. Il faut pas le modifier. Benesba, c'est pour te dire que tu es à la gare de Melah, mais tu jamais te dire que tu es à la gare de Melah. Et même quand tu es à la gare de Melah, tu es à la gare de Melah. La lagune de Garmelah joue un rôle très important pour les oiseaux migrateurs. C'est un site d'hivernage des oiseaux où les oiseaux se reposent, se nourrissent et passent l'hiver ici. 
Ralmelach, quand j'étais petite, c'était un paysage unique. Il y avait la mer, il y avait la montagne, il y avait euh, des communautés locales et c'était vraiment magique. Qui dit Ralmelach dit d'abord euh, maintenant c'est une ville Ramsar. Donc euh, elle contient des écosystèmes méditerranéens qui sont relativement uniques. Une harmonie entre la population résidente ici avec leur environnement, ils vivent de ce qui les entoure. Avec la sécheresse, avec tout, qu'on le voit à l'échelle mondiale, ce n'est pas exceptionnel pour la Tunisie ou bien pour notre région de Gataï. Surtout ces petits parcelles-là, parce qu'ils vivent à 100% du pluviométrie et du marais de mer. Si ces deux facteurs-là sont réduits, ils sont maintenant déjà réduits, ils sont vont être plus réduits. Donc pourquoi on va chercher à investir sur l'irrigation, puisqu'on a une irrigation naturelle Mais il faut la protéger, c'est ça le grand problème. Il faut protéger ces euh, champs, ces, ces euh, genres d'irrigation. احنا علاش فهمتي نحبوا حل معناتها توا تتسويت للبحيره على خاطركش البحيره هذه معناتها هي مورد الرزق الوحيد معناتها احنا انا كي نقعد ما نخدمش اليوم ما عنديش ما ناكل بروتيجي او سافوار كوا ريستوري اون تيرم دو بريوريتي il faut connaître et pour connaître il faut évaluer il faut évaluer les valeurs écosystémiques ou les valeurs économiques qui sont fournies par les différents services de la lagune et de ses environnements à la communauté et à l'économie nationale. Il s'avère que ces services sont très menacés par plusieurs pressions et si on n'arrive pas à gérer au mieux ces services, ces services vont disparaître dans dix ans. Donc nous, notre rôle en tant que Fonds mondial pour la nature, le Bureau de l'Afrique du Nord, WWF, est de rassembler toutes les parties prenantes qui interviennent dans la gestion de la zone côtière et de la ville de Ralmel et de ses ressources naturelles autour de la même table pour essayer de comprendre les problématiques et d'identifier ensemble quelles solutions potentielles on peut euh, concrétiser dans le cadre de ce projet. Et euh, il est de notre devoir d'assister, d'appuyer les gens de Ralmel pour trouver des solutions. بالنسبة للغر ملح عنا مشاكل موجودة فيها اللي متعلق بالتغيرات المناخية اللي هي مع تتأكل الشريط الشريط الساحلي هذه مسألة مهمة برشة مع تحنا نعطيها أولوية الأولوية الأولى على الأولوية الثانية فما الحاجة الثانية اللي هي جي بعد هي التلوث التلوث هذا مع فيه فيه مع عنده عدة مصادر عند مصدر المصدر الأولاني هي محطة التطهير نتاع أوتيك وكذلك المنطقة الصناعية نتاع أوتيك وعندنا تلوث آخر اللي هو محلي اللي جاي من من المستغلين نتاع الشط وهذا اللي احنا توا قاعدين نبحثوا باش نعملوا لهم خزانات مع عازلة دي فوسي طونش معناتها في المناطق هذه Le rendement de pêche a beaucoup baissé donc il faudra étudier une meilleure alimentation de la lagune et qui permet cet équilibre d'entrée d'eau de la mer vers la lagune et inversement, bien sûr, on devrait absolument interdire les rejets des eaux usées. Des éléments scientifiques que nous connaissons maintenant, comme l'élévation accélérée du nouveau de la mer, et ce que cela implique sur l'écosystème, sur les, les, les habitants, etc. Donc il faut absolument se préparer. Il faut que nos gouvernements reconnaissent cela, l'intègrent dans les politiques de planification et font en sorte qu'on euh, qu mette en place les activités ou les mesures ou les infrastructures nécessaires pour protéger aussi bien les écosystèmes que les populations qui seraient d'ici 2100 encore plus vulnérables au changement climatique.
Alex, uh, this video, which I had the chance actually to watch before, is always very inspiring. A lot of words of wisdom also from the local communities. A lot of alarming uh, inf data as uh, shown in the last uh, images, so definitely elements of reflection for us. Let me now move uh, to session uh, one. So I'm um, pleased actually to give the floor to Ms. Sana uh, Medzugi from uh, Medwet. Uh, and uh, Sana, the floor is yours. Uh, yours. Sorry, you will focus on the uh, networks of uh, Ramsar site managers, indeed on the aim, on the history, and how you know the network is indeed active uh, and uh, very much needed uh, for this day work. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alessandra. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sanem Nuzuri. I'm part of the Medved team. I'm uh, the facilitator of the Medved Managers Network. Today, I will give a very brief presentation about uh, the network and then give the floor of, of two of its members, uh, Nuhay and Hazem, uh, to share uh, about their work on the floor, on the ground. Sorry. <laughs> So yeah, uh, as we all need, there is a growing need to adapt uh, uh, policies and implement action on the ground in favor of the conservation of uh, uh, and sustainable use of our Mediterranean wetlands. In order to support them, uh, Medved has created in 2018 the Mediterranean Site uh, Managers Network, which is a med membership network of wetland manager dedicated to fostering the best management practices knowledge exchange and public education about the value and services of our wetlands. So the network is set up as a, a share and learn network uh, and the managers can benefit from the knowledge sharing platform, the capacity building program, the action and advocacy action for the site conservation and wise use, uh, all the programs of training between Mediterranean wetland sites and uh, the guidelines that we provide uh, on sustainable use practices of wetland. And, um, now we are playing uh, more and more the role of uh, connecting managers with par partners and donors and uh, to help them to promote their, uh, their uh, uh, wetlands on the Mediterranean and a global scale. Today we have uh, 50 members around the Mediterranean and we are still uh, trying to reach a new member and to uh, make our network uh, uh, bigger. These are some... Uh, photos of some previous event, uh, online and in-person event. And then I'm giving the floor to Hazem and Nuha to share about their work on the ground. And thank you. Thanks to you, Sarah. So please, colleagues, you take the floor. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, good morning and thank you for inviting us for uh, uh, this important event. And uh, today I will uh, present about uh, Azraq Wetland Reserve uh, in Jordan. So uh, it's... Uh, one of the wetlands in Jordan and also the uh, maybe the oldest uh, wetland in the Arab region uh, and the first wetland in the in the Arab uh, region also uh, to join Ramsar Convention. So uh, today uh, we will talk about uh, Azraq Wetland Reserve as. Uh, uh, as I told you, the only uh, Ramsar site uh, in uh, the, in Jordan, and also uh, excuse me, uh, can we share the the uh, the presentation? Let me call the technicians one moment. Albert, sorry, can you please uh, share the presentation from your end?
You have a problem in sharing yourself as them? Yeah, yeah. I, I, there is no icon. Yes, now. No, this is the one from Noah. For Noah, yeah. Sorry. It's the other presentation from the colleague. Alberto, I don't know if you can hear me. It's the other presentation from Jordan. Or a proposal could also be that we go ahead with the one of Noah. In the meanwhile, we get uh, in contact with the technicians for the for yours, Azam. What do you think? Oh, 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 don't mind. Yeah? yeah. So, yeah. No. so let, let me see. Sorry. Colleagues? Just a moment. Now you can share your presentation. Your... Yes, just a minute. So, yeah, thank you I'm so much. My presentation. Perfect. So let's move with Nas and then we'll go back to Azam. Sorry, Azam, for these uh, technical uh, difficulties. I'll get in contact myself with the technician, hopefully. Uh, good morning, I'm Dr. Noha. I'm working in Ministry of Environment and, and I'm the national focal point of Midwest. Um, I would like to start first with the global and regional uh, restoration initiatives, including the UN Decade for Ocean and Ecosystem, the Global Biodiversity Framework for um, Target 2 that calls for effective restoration of uh, uh, ecosystems, and also the SDGs 2023 that calls for conservation protection protection, restoration, and nature-based solution. As for Egypt, um, I will present the national efforts for restoration, coping these initiatives uh, with a focus on Northern Lakes and uh, Barolos Lake case study. So Egypt has about 10 lakes, five of them are called Northern Lakes. They are all directly connected to the Mediterranean Sea, uh, except for Mariut, uh, Barolos Sorry, and Martawi. Yes. Sorry, we don't see we don't see your presentation. Uh, I shared it. It's I uh, I don't know for why I we don't we, we don't see it. Um, I don't know. Maybe there is a technical. And okay, now I we see we see it. Okay. Sorry, no. Go ahead. Okay. It is not directed by me. Ah, okay. So um. Barda Wheel and Brollos are um, declared as a Ramsar site of international uh, importance. Uh, and Brollos uh, was declared also as a nature protectorate. Um, they are all, um, uh, all wetlands in Egypt are declared as important bird areas. And um, another, the, the other slide. The others, right? Fishing is the leading activity in the northern lakes. Uh, they contribute to about 10.5% of the total fish production in Egypt with a value of 6 billion Egyptian pounds. And uh, Brolos Lake has a maximum production with a value of 3 billion uh, Egyptian pounds. Next slide. Um, According to the IBCC, the Delta region as a low-laying area and the northern wetland are highly affected by climate change threats, including sea level rise, submersion, intuition, saltwater intrusion, and extreme events. The other slide. The other. Um, although they play a crucial role for uh, regulating and mitigating of um, climate change, uh, as they are considered the first line of protection, protection protecting the behind um, uh, economic and strategic activities from salt water intrusion and sea level rise, in addition to uh, regulating groundwater and soil moisture that supports agriculture activities in the region, uh, water quality purification carbon sequestration and also supporting a huge number of biodiversity species. The other slide. Um, uh, 
A recent study focused on economic valuation of the ecosystem services provided by rollers wetland in regard to climate regulation. The uh, study concluded the high potential of rollers lake as um, carbon sequ sequestration, water purification, flood control, and coastal protection against erosion and marine submersion. The study concluded that the potential of uh, uh, rollers lake to store carbon reached 400 million euros with a high potential to increase this value by enhancing the ecosystem and environmental condition. The other side, next. Um, another uh, important study focused on uh, economic valuation of provisional services provided by Rollers Lake in regard to local communities and also gender equality. The result of the project shows that um, uh, the fishing, aquaculture, agriculture were the dominant activities in Rollers region, while the uh, reed, uh, reed harvesting and salt extraction was a minor, and uh, the project uh, supported um, uh, supporting the recreational activities for bird watching and also for uh, touristic uh, activities in the in the lake next for management um, the environmental law give the authority to Ministry of Environment to regular monitoring of water quality. We have a program started in 2009, management of natural protect rate, developing of national action strategies and programs for restoration and following up regional and international conventions. Another important um, uh, law for protection of lakes and development of fish resources that focused on lake protection, pollution reduction, and also management of economic activities in and around the wetlands. Uh, next, please. Um, uh, accordingly, a presidential program um, has started in 2016 for Egyptian lake restoration for the sake of local communities and increasing their income. Um, uh, one of them is, project, uh, is a project for Brolos Lake uh, with a target to enhancing the water circulation inside the lake and the water exchange between the lake and the Mediterranean Sea. The results of the project show with improvement in water quality and also increase in fish production and restoring some fish species with a high economic value. Next, please. Um, a nature-based solution project called Enhancing Climate Change Adaptation in the North Coast of Egypt and Nile Delta region in Egypt, uh, focused, um, uh, funded by Green Climate uh, Fund with the aim of uh, reducing threats of sea level rise in, by implementing 69 kilometer of salt um, uh, soft structure, uh, protection structure using artificial sand dikes uh, in five vulnerable hotspots in uh, the Nile Delta and also developing integrated coastal zone management for the northern coast of Egypt, enhancing warning system for sea level rise, uh, capacity building of stakeholders, and the raising awareness of local communities of threats of climate change and alternatives. Um, the project idea come from the local communities living um, around Rolos Lake that used harvested reeds uh, inside the lake to build artificial sand dunes to protect their uh, economic uh, activities behind the lake, especially agricultural activities from sea level rise and um, saltwater intrusion. Uh, next. Finally, I will end here by it's time for wetland restoration. And thank you. Many thanks, Anna, for showing these very interesting cases. I mean, it gives us really the ground dimension of uh, how things have to be carried out. And uh, in the meanwhile, we have been uh, able actually to um, fix, I hope, uh, the uh, presentation of Azam. So please, Azam, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Noah, again. Thank you. Azam, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. So uh, I am... Just uh, waiting for the uh, to share the yeah okay next please okay so Azraq Wetland Reserve uh, is one of the Jordanian protected uh, areas uh, and also it's the 
uh, stopover for migratory birds from Europe to Africa and vice versa. And also it's located in the uh, heart of Eastern Desert of Jordan uh, between uh, the, the limestone and the uh, volcanic stone or basalt stone. So it's a unique uh, ecosystem because it's uh, located, uh, next please, yeah, it's located in the heart, in the uh, biggest uh, uh, drainage rechargeable uh, aquifer in, in, in Jordan. It's a transboundary aquifer from uh, uh, Syria to Saudi Arabia. So the vast majority of the aquifer uh, locates in the Jordanian territory and the wetland uh, emerged because of the natural springs uh, in, the, in the aquifer. So... Uh, uh, and one percent in Saudi Arabia and five percent in Syria, and uh, it's by the way the most uh, recharge can happen in the Syrian uh, territory because in in Azraq uh, area it's uh, a desert ecosystem. So the the rainfall uh, average is uh, between fifty to ninety uh, millimeter per year. So uh, the, the recharge of the aquifer can, can, can happen in the Syrian territory. Uh, next, please. And by the early 90s, all the wetland disappeared because of the overpumping, overuse of water and over extraction and pumping water back to the largest governorates in Jordan, Amman, Erbid, and Zarqa. So affected significantly in the water table. So uh, then the water table lowered down and that led to the dryness of an oasis. Next. We started a rehabilitation uh, project uh, by uh, 1994 to 1998 we aimed at restoring 10% of the former oasis of the natural and near natural habitats. Uh, also, uh, we aimed at uh, um, uh, halting further degradation of the aquatic uh, ecosystems in the oasis and also uh, protecting the only uh, invertebrate species of fish, which is called Afanius sarhani. And also in the same time, developing uh, sustainable programs in the field of ecotourism and socioeconomic uh, development linked to the concept of nature conservation and integrated with. And also we aimed uh, through the restoration project to establish a sustainable basis for the utilization of water resources of the Azraq Basin. Next, please. Next also. Also, in, uh, by 1994, in order to, to start the, this project, because you know Jordan is the poorest country per capita in the world. And this is, by the way, a, a great challenge for uh, the sustainability of Azraq Wetland Reserve. So in order to, to, to maintain 10% of the former oasis, this is our the, the general goal of, uh, of the uh, of the uh, wetland and uh, so we signed an agreement with Water Authority of Jordan in order to provide us with 1.5 to 2.5 million cubic meter in order to sustain the 10% of the former oasis. Next please. Here some, some like uh, works of uh, heavy bulldozers and also uh, uh, using leveling for the, the, the wetland. Here we didn't uh, reinvent the wheel. We, we, can, we, we, uh, we get satellite images of the, of the wetland from the 60s and also from the uh, local community feedback and also uh, the scientific uh, research. And we started re restoration and rehabilitation in the, in the, in the wetland in order to, to uh, restore 10% of the uh, wetland. Next. Here also some of the uh, channeling and also uh, some uh, when we, we start pumping back water to the, to the pools. 
Next. Yeah, also next, please. Also, the wetland uh, uh, was uh, expanded also from 12 square kilometer to 74 square, square kilometer by cabinet decision. Here we included the, the mud flat. The mud flat is attractive point for uh, millions of birds uh, during the fl flooding season. And now Ezraq now is uh, 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 receiving more floods. And now uh, the wetland is full of water because of the seasonal flooding. Because of now we, we are receiving a lot of rains over the past uh, three days. And uh, now we are, we hope that we, we get uh, very uh, fruitful season now and also receive many birds during the uh, winter, winter migration. Next. Next, please. Here we have uh, uh, many programs or conservation programs. One of the most important uh, conservation programs is Afanius Sarhani. This is the only endemic vertebrate species of fish. And here we conduct studies and surveys for protecting this kind of fish. It doesn't live anywhere except for in Azraq. This is endemic to, to the area. And also, uh, uh, this is first uh, classified or uh, by three Austrian uh, researchers, Volvok, Scholl, and Krop. So they classified this this kind of fish as Athanius. And Sarhani, because of a Sarhani wadi uh, crossing uh, large parts of Azraq. So this is called Azraq killifish. I mean, you, st you still have one minute, huh? Really? So uh, next, please. This is also birds, uh, uh, the, the program of, uh, of birds and also ringing. And we have also many like uh, surveys conducted. Next. Next also. Here we have a lot of biodiversity in the, in the, in the reserve. Next. Also, uh, next, please. Here, the, the patrolling and how we conserve the, the, the uh, biodiversity and how to protect all the uh, animals or uh, fauna, flora, etc. Next. Uh, so here, Azraq Wetland Reserve also provide uh, the many like uh, ecosystem services like provisioning, regulatory, supporting and cultural. So it's very important wetland for people and for also for humans and for uh, animals as well. So it's very important in the in the eastern desert and for Jordan as well. Next. We developed a lot of ecotourism uh, uh, activities and facilities in, in, in Azraq, uh, the visitor center, uh, wood, wood pathways, uh, bird, uh, bird, high, bird hides, Etc. Uh, next. And also we have a lodge which was uh, uh, inaugurated by a royal patronage 2008. Next. Here we developed also some like ecotourism uh, activities like cycling in the area. Next. And also picnic area for the for the visitors of the wetland. Next, here we have some in, uh, experiential tourism in the in the area because in Azraq we have three social groups: Druze, Chechen, and Bedouin. So we have to to integrate them and involve them in our uh, day to day activities and create like income for people around the wetland so this is one of the of the uh, people or uh, social groups in azraq druze uh, people and some activities with them next here also the bedouin the bedouin experience in azraq next and here also the the chechen experience from uh, in azraq next here also we have a lot of like uh, in, uh, eco uh, environmental education programs. 
So we, we created many activities like a nature night program and also targeting school students, universities or farmers and raise awareness in the, in the, uh, in the area and celebrate the World Wetland Day also. Next. Azam, I have unfortunately to ask you to close in order to allow also to the other speakers. This is, we, we are about to finish. Thank you. Next. Here also the outreach program in the reserve. Next. Here the, some uh, like the, the direct benefits for the local community over the past five years. Next. Here also the socioeconomic projects and how women, Azraq uh, women uh, participate in many handicrafts in the area. Next. Next, please. Here the, the international recognition and awards that the wetland received. So since Ramsar Convention till the Peace Park, uh, also uh, in the in the in the, in the wetland currently. Next. Thank you for listening and also for your time. Uh, really, thanks to you for this uh, beautiful uh, presentation, you, Noah, and Sana. Thank you very much for this session that, of course, bring us to the local dimension. And indeed, thank you very much for highlighting not just, you know, the environmental benefits, but indeed also the very important socioeconomic ones. So with this, we close this uh, session and we move to the next one. Colleagues, sorry for waiting. Uh, we are moving actually to the uh, session dedicated to payment for environmental services. And without any further ado, let me give the floor to Lisa Nul from Tour de Balat. Lisa, the floor is yours and the presentation is already uh, ready. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for this invitation to participate today. Um, I'm very excited to be here to and represent the, the Tour de Balat. Um, and I'm glad to see there is such a high level of, of participation um, in, in the group today. I am trying to get it on. Please put a full screen if you can. I'm trying to do that. Um, okay. It's just the icon yeah. the right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, Perfect. thank you very much. Um, so my presentation will be um, a small introduction to the payment for um, environmental services or ecosystem services. Um, just to say that this is a concept that's now been uh, used in conservation for over 15 years. It's been tested in a variety of ways. And after my presentation, I think there'll be some examples of um, cases that we have here in the Mediterranean area. So this will just be a very basic um, introduction to the concept. So, Basically, payment for ecosystem services are voluntary transactions between a service seller and a service buyer that takes place on the condition that either a specific ecosystem service is provided or if land is used um, in a certain way to secure a certain service. So there are some key words that are really important. There's a seller and a buyer. So that means that there is a, a supply and a demand that is currently available and that this supply and demand can be used for the benefit of nature conservation. So looking at this small schema, um, we can see that there, in most cases for the payment for ecosystem services, the ecosystem services are upstream or they're not located exactly in the same place where the services are provided. They can be on a very small scale, but um, most of the larger scale cases the upstream ecosystem services um, are not in the same location. So you can see that there's the upstream services that are provided and that the people or the services that are being provided downstream are connected to these upstream services um, through payments or compensations or incentives. So these payments can be cash, they can be in-kind contributions, they can also be technical assistance. So it's not always a valuation as far as um, economic payments, but they can be payments in, in other forms. And in exchange for these payments, the downstream users are benefiting from certain ecosystem services. And the ecosystem services can be very, very large 
um, ranging from water quality, water quantity, erosion reduction, carbon capture, habitat conservation, and I'll go into that a little bit more now. But before I do, um, basically it's important to say that payment for ecosystem services are developed either in one of two ways. Either first, there's a set of stakeholders that recognize that there's a depletion in the resources and there's a real demand for these resources. So it's a demand um, type of incentive to, to initiate these ecosystem services um, payments, or it can be the other way around where there's a supply. So there's a particular aim that's identified. Usually it can be in relation to uh, the protection or the management of natural resources. And the supply can try and find a market to help pay for the, the different um, techniques or the different management that's necessary to provide these services. Um, some of the typical ecosystem services that are used for the payments, and I think we're hearing about it a lot, especially in the last five years and now with the, the COPE that just finished, is related to carbon sequestration or storage. Um, in the, the carbon sequestration and storage, there is a huge um, market now that's being developed internationally and nationally at different levels to, to help uh, provide um, financial incentives and payments for especially not only for wetlands, but in our case for wetlands um, to, to, to hold in the, 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 um, the carbon and to provide a, a real buffer for climate change. There's also um, biodiversity protection and bundled services, which in the past have pr proven to be quite, quite highly efficient um, as far as payment for ecosystem services. Um, but one of the, the things that we've seen is sometimes it's difficult to organize the payment around the biodiversity protection and also to maintain these um, payments over the long term. Another typical uh, payment for ecosystem services is watershed protection. And this often happens when there's at least one, but there could be several stakeholders that organize themselves together to protect the, the water resources in a specific area. Um, usually the payment for ecosystem services are done directly from the um, demanders to the suppliers. But in watershed protection in the past, this has often been done through non-governmental organizations who channel these um, payments to specific farmers or users. And uh, the last one that I'll mention today is there can be also payment for ecosystem services to take into account landscape beauty. So it's a non, um, it's a very aesthetic beauty or there's, it's a non, physical attribute um, linked to, to nature conservation. There are seven key principles often highlighted in um, payment for ecosystem services. First and most important are that the payments are voluntary, so they cannot be forced and um, both the demand and the supply has to be voluntary. Um, the second principle is that the beneficiary pays. So, um, the people or the stakeholders or the, the organizations that are receiving the, the benefits of these services are the ones that are supposed to contribute financially or technically to the, to the payment. The payments should be direct payments so that the people who are providing the service receive the payment indirect. But what we've seen in practice over the last 10 years is often there are intermediaries whether it be the, the stock market or whether they be NGOs. Um, but in practice, um, in the best practices, it's usually done uh, through direct payment. The fourth principle is that the payments um, are made for actions over and above those that are just status quo. So what we're trying to do is not just maintain the status quo of the management or the conservation that's happening, but to really make improvements so that there is a real benefit for the payments. Um, fifth is the conditionality. So that this for me is really, really important. It's impact driven. It means that the payments are dependent on the delivery of the ecosystem services benefits. So um, it means that 
if we're just working on the status quo or if the manage if the management is not providing the services, then the payments should not be made. Um, again, this is not always how it's done in practice. Usually in practice, um, the implementation of the payment or the payment is based on the implement implementation of the management practices, which should lead to the ecosystem services, but may not always be the case. The, the sixth principle that's important to mention is ensuring the permanence. Um, so that means that the, um, the payments should be considered for the benefits that we're going to have over time. So they're not just a one-time payment for something that's going to happen now this month or this year, but it's something that we should ensure over time um, to have the benefits for the future. And the seventh um, principle that's very important to mention is to avoid leakages. This means that ensure that the benefits that we're providing or the ecosystem services that we're providing from this payment are not in detriment for ecosystem services that were previously provided in another area. Um, there are two other components for success that I'd like to mention. Um, first, that there really needs to be an appropriate transaction infrastructure in place. So it can be a marketplace. Um, and this sometimes is, it takes a while to really put into place before we can have the effective payments between the providers and the sellers. Um, and this is something that really needs to be done by economists or people who have experience in the marketplace and not necessarily by the conservation managers to ensure the success over time. The second component that, especially coming from the Tour du Valet, that I'd like to, to emphasize is there really needs to be a robust scientific baseline. Um, again, like I said, the payments for ecosystem services should ensure that there is an impact and that there is an added value to, to doing these management changes. Um, and in order to, to, to measure that, we really need to have a baseline um, information about the site and what that site is contributing to the ecosystem services. There are several enabling factors that are also important to mention. First is the valuation. Um, so it means that we need to quantify the impact of the service that we're providing. And this is often leads to economic or monetary value. Um, there's been a lot of criticism about monetary monetizing um, ecosystem services, but for the payments, it's very it's a very important step. Um, and the second enabling factor is that there needs to be legal and institutional frameworks in place in place. This means that um, it could be at a European level, but also at a country level or a regional level, there needs to be the institutions that can ensure that the payments are done in a legal framework that is beneficial to both the provider and the seller. And the third um, enabling factor that's also very important is the organization of stakeholders. The stakeholders are the key behind the payment for ecosystem services. Um, and when we're talking about stakeholders, it can be the larger society, it can be the specific farmers, it can be uh, the municipality. And um, organizing the stakeholders before engaging in the payment for ecosystem services is extremely important to avoid conflicts in the future. Lisa, there are several. Lisa, one, more yeah. minute. one more minute. Okay, thank you. this is a, thank the you. last slide. So um, this is just a, a small schema that shows what how you can put in place the payment for ecosystem services. I will not go into detail as we're running out of time, but it's something that was developed and should be um, really looked into before engaging on any new type of ecosystem service payment. So just to conclude, um, payments for ecosystem services can encourage the maintenance of natural ecosystems through environmental friendly practices, and they can be very useful in conserving natural resources but we must be careful because they are not a blueprint for environmental conservation. They, not, they cannot be implemented and copied in every single case, and maybe they're not applicable in each case. Um, so it's a, it's a useful instrument for nature conservation in specific cases, and it needs to be looked into um, before trying to implement them in, in each case. Thank you very much, and I'm available for any questions afterwards.
Many thanks, Lisa. Very interesting and also very interesting uh, your final um, reflection on the fact that, of course, it's not a substitute, but uh, needs to be um, contextualized. So with this, we will move immediately to the presentation of Anis uh, Guelmani uh, from Tour de Valat. Uh, I just ask you to please uh, try to keep your presentation within uh, five minutes, if possible. We are running very late and it's very important that everybody has the possibility to speak. Thank you very much, Anis. Um, five minutes, you said? I thought you, I had 10 minutes, sorry. I know, but we need to accommodate. So please uh, try to keep your presentation, maybe not to 10, to 6, 7. Thank you. Okay, uh, that will be, yeah, uh, uh, the, 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 this is challenging, <laughs> I'll try. Okay, so good morning. Um, yeah, following the presentation uh, provided by Lisa, um, please let me know if it's full screen. Yes, it is, it's perfect. Now we lost it. Can you put it back? Yeah. Now, yes. Good. Okay, so I will give you an example of the implementation of the the concept of payment for ecosystem services in the Cebu River Basin in Morocco. Um. So. Yeah, so just maybe a few words, but I always keep it very, very quickly. The Cebu River Basin is one of the largest river basins in, in, in Morocco. It provides a, a third of the uh, surface water uh, and also the, the, the underground water uh, at the national scale, and it hosts 7 million uh, inhabitants. Um, it, it, it hosts also seven Ramsar sites, one Ramsar city, the city of Ifhan, uh, two national parks and 16, uh, 17 sites for biological and ecological interest. So as you can see, it's it has also very high values for biodiversity and uh, and uh, and ecosystems in uh, in in the whole region, in the North African region and Maghreb countries. Um, and wetlands within the Cebu represent approximately two percent of the basin's area. So this is based on uh, re recent satellite images processing for 2022. Two percent. It's uh, in the average of the Mediterranean. Uh, the, the Mediterranean. It's in the yeah the, the, the same uh, or equal to the average of the Mediterranean countries. And but if you look at the trends uh, between 1990 and 2020, so we estimate that we've lost. 26% of the natural and semi-natural wetlands within the basin and the artificial wetlands or human made wetlands have increased uh, by more than 300% uh, percent between the two time periods, so in, in a very short time period, 30 years only. Um, and the main pressures, if you look, for example, at the land use and land cover trends, it, the main pressures on this uh, natural ecosystems in general and natural wetlands in particular are uh, mainly the agriculture, the development of agricultural areas and the, the uh, intensification of agricultural practices, uh, but also the sprawl of uh, built up area and urban area and the development of artificial wetlands, mainly uh, the, the, the constructions of new dams and, uh, and pumps for irrigation. So this is what we call uh, water abstraction pressures, uh, uh, especially specifically on the, the, the surface water, but also on the underground water. So you can see between these two maps in 1990 and 2020, the development of all of this artificial uh, uh, water storage infra infrastructure, uh, uh, both for large dams, very large dams, but also small ponds uh, and uh, and um, uh, tanks for uh, irrigation uh, and agricultural uses. Um, so this has led to uh, a loss of, uh, of of wetlands, and this loss of wetlands. It was caused by their by their conversion, direct conversion, so the the direct loss of the wetland habitat, but also uh, the, the 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 dry out due to the intensively used the, the intensive use of uh, of water resources. For example, uh, here in uh, the uh, um, Awa uh, Awa Lake, uh, which has totally uh, almost disappeared uh, due to the to 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 the intensive pumping of underground water for irrigation. So there is an urgent need to halt and reserve these alarming trends. 
And this is why we developed with uh, our partners in Morocco, uh, actually they coordinate the, this, uh, the, the, this project, uh, the, the Living Planet Morocco, the, 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 the Cebu Water Fund, which is uh, based on a sustainable fi financing mechanism uh, for based on payment for ecosystem services with four main objectives. So the first one is conserving wetlands and water resources restoring natural habitats and their biodiversity, promoting the sustainable agriculture, and also preserving traditional socioeconomic activities. And as you can see, all these objectives are more or less linked to the uh, to, to, to different SDGs, uh, uh, targets, and indicators. So the governance of the Cebu Water Fund is, uh, the, so the Cebu Water Fund is coordinated by the Living Plant Morocco, which is a national NGO in Morocco. And they have, national partners and international partners involved within within this uh, this uh, the, 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 the the governance and the steering committee uh, 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 and the total is also contributing in the scientific and the technical for the scientific and technical support to 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 the implementation of the cebu water plan and we have three pillars for this fund how it works so the first one is the capacity building so we try to provide uh, 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 training workshops and also uh, 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 capacity capacity building and capacity uh, reinforcement for the local community, but also for national uh, for national partners, both from institutional and uh, civil society organizations. Uh, for example, we organized uh, several several uh, uh, workshops since the last uh, four or five years in Tunisia, uh, in Morocco, but also uh, in Nairobi for with the, to, to extend with other existing water funds in uh, in Africa. The second pillar is the grant for local NGOs. So here we we try to support the local NGOs and local initiatives for wetlands conservation and uh, restoration. Here are some examples uh, uh, where we, we provided uh, financial and technical support to local organizations for uh, to restore wetland uh, in the mid Atlas Mountains, and also to, uh, to 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 other local NGOs in order to uh, raise awareness of the local population um, with regards uh, to wetlands conservation and uh, and, uh, and and preservation and restoration as well. And the third pillar is the conservation and the restoration project. So here we directly uh, implement support and implement uh, this uh, this project with the, with the help of uh, of, uh, of other uh, organizations. Um, here again are some examples. For example, uh, based on the work done within this Cebu Water Fund, uh, the, the, the 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 Living Planet Morocco were was able to designate three new Ramsar sites within the the, the river basin, and also to uh, designate Ifran as uh, the first Ramsar city in Morocco. And we have uh, we are running actually a big project restoration project to revive the the Daitawa Lake in the Mid Atlas, which has been totally uh, degraded and uh, and dried out due to intensive ag agriculture. So both we are working on the physical restoration of the lake, but also on uh, on 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 changing the, the the practices, the agricultural practices in the in the subcatchment area because. Both are linked. Uh, good governance uh, is also uh, is also needed for 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 to 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 have a successful restoration activity on the ground. So this is the story. So we started the 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 the, the story in two thousand and seven uh, with the first studies that, uh, that have been conducted. So all this uh, was based on uh, on knowledge, scientific knowledge, uh, and uh, and studies. And in 2017, the first fund for the conservation of uh, the Atlas Lake uh, was, was received. Um, we made the first feasibility study of the Cebu Water Fund in 2018. Uh, the official la la launch was, was in 2019. And then we had the, the, the first agreement signed with the main public partners, uh, specifically the, 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 the Cebu River Basin Agency, but also other uh, partners from different ministries for of interior, of uh, tourism, agriculture, and environment. Uh, we get also additional funds in 2021 to uh, implement new projects, specifically restoration and 
uh, 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 Rising Awareness Project, uh, engagement of the first partners from the private sector in 2022, and the upscaling from the mid atlas and the, 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 the upstream part of the basin to the entire Cebu basin, including the downstream part, uh, started uh, this year. With uh, with the new project also funded by uh, by the Fondation Francaise Berlin de Monaco, and the story will be continued. Uh, con con continued, of course. Uh, where we are, we, it's it's a new initiative started uh, just a few years ago, and all the actions and the activities are still ongoing uh, with the implementation of this concept of payment for ecosystem services. Uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, in the Cebu River Basin by involving by involving different stakeholders and partners from private and public sector. So thank you for your attention, and I hope I. Many thanks, Annie. I really appreciated your efforts actually to condense all this very important information. Um, of course, the story is impressive, and as you said, it's really work uh, in uh, uh, progress still, despite it was started in two thousand seven. Uh, I'd like also to remind to all the participants that, of course, all these presentations will be made available. So, um, and you can, of course, contact also bilaterally all the various uh, speakers for any further, you know, follow up you might be wishing to do. So with this, we close uh, session two and we move to session three, which is indeed on tools to support wetland restoration. We have with us uh, Gizem uh, Ak. Dogan, I hope I pronounce it well, from the Mediterranean Conservation Society. So, Gizem, the floor is yours. Uh, we look forward to your presentation on the Green Light Protocol and the steps toward the restoration of the uh, wetland uh, Gorse uh, area in uh, Turkey. Again, please uh, um, accommodate uh, the time and try to be as uh, much as possible, you know, um, around the five to seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. I, I will try to share my screen. Okay, I guess you can perfect. see Yeah, that. perfect. No, okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you to all those present answers, presenters who share their valuable knowledge and experience with us. And thank you for all having me here. Um, I'm Gizem uh, from Mediterranean Conservation Society, or Aktens Kormadani, as we say in Turkish. I am here today uh, to share our experience of green light protocol in Gökçe wetland in Turkey. Uh, but let me first introduce my organization. Uh, AKD was founded in Izmir, Turkey, as a national non governmental organization, and we are carrying out science-based projects to raise awareness of and protect the Mediterranean's rich biodiversity, ecosystem, and cultural heritage. Our work focuses primarily on endangered marine species, such as the Mediterranean monk seal, sandbar shark, and monitoring and restoration of the marine ecosystems, co-management of marine protected areas, and no fishing zones. And we received many national and international awards regarding our work. The very first one is the Marine Conservation Leadership Award given to our founder and the president of our organization, Zafar Kaya, by Marsh Marine Conservation Leadership. And the most recent one is the Goldman Environmental Prize, uh, also called as Green Nobel. And you can look further on our website or social media if you would like to learn more about us. And this is the reason why I am here today. Gökçe Wetland is the first pilot site of the Greenlight Protocol. And it's also our first uh, wetland project. Uh, we give a lot of importance to that project because it's really important uh, for us to understand uh, ecological connectivity between the wetland ecosystem and the marine ecosystem. And Gökçe wetland is located near to Akyaka and uh, it is in the it is located in the Gökova Special Environmental Protected Areas. So what is the Green Light Protocol? Uh, the Green Light Protocol is a tool created by the Mediterranean Alliance for Wetlands to start a wetland restoration movement in the Mediterranean region. 
by applying a method to promote restoration projects at the international level by using the power of images. And the protocol has three steps and the process starts with a filling a form. Uh, and with that form, you can provide all the details and it is evaluated by the steering committee. And with this protocol, the Alliance supports the NGO, in our case, it was us, in three aspects. The first one is building a common strategy. To build a common strategy, we had workshop to define to our strategy and action plan. And we did a field assessment together with the restoration experts. And thanks to Third Bola for that. And the second one is sharing a common vision uh, in order to have this vision, we held stakeholder meetings and shared the understanding with landscape architecture to produce visualization. And you can see on the screen that this is the uh, example of the uh, visualization. And after having the first draft, we used that draft to share with the all stakeholders, the local residents, uh, governmental bodies, the businesses in the region. And we uh, conducted, conducted surveys about that and we received their feedbacks and share with the la landscape architecture and updated the uh, visual, visualization. And you can see that all, most of the, uh, most of the interviewees say that they wouldn't like the car traffic in the region, and this is how they want to see that area in the future. So last but not least, the third phase is the communication materials for public acceptance and fundraising, and we prepared that, and you can see the uh, pilot, uh, you can see the visual we created for the Goethe wetland, and in that visual, uh, we try to tell uh, what is important for that wetland area and where it's located and uh, which kind of what kind of species uh, they have and how we plan to do restoration activities. And we also prepared a short video that explains both green light protocol and what's happening in Gökçe wetland. So I guess here I can start that. It's a short video, it's only three minutes and I am also uh, have only a few slides. Many thanks, many thanks, 
Isn't oh, thank I, you. I guess there's a problem with this. There sound. was a problem with the audio, but what I suggest is that for all those that are interested in, uh, you know, mm, mm -hmm. I can share the, the link in the chat. You can share the link in the chat. Yeah. And it will be really a pleasure to watch mm -hmm. the video in its full version. So yeah. with this, thank you so much, uh, Gizem. Mm -hmm. And let me move back uh, to Anis. For um, another brief presentation on wetland mapping and assessment to prioritize restoration, Anis. Yes. Just give me a few seconds. I share my screen. Is it full screen? Yes, perfect. Okay. So my second presentation will be on the uh, the how to map existing and lost wetlands in order to. Uh, 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 find areas to prioritize uh, wetlands restoration, uh, and this based on earth observation uh, data. So first, let's start with uh, very very quickly with the, some figures on the Mediterranean wetlands. Uh, at the regional scale, we've lost uh, almost half of the wetlands of the natural wetlands uh, since the 70s, so in during the last 50 years in the in the Mediterranean region. Um, and this has also impacted the biodiversity that these ecosystems uh, host. For example, we've lost, uh, uh, we estimate that we've lost 28% uh, uh, of the biodiversity uh, within the freshwater biomes or freshwater ecosystems in the Mediterranean regions. And we have uh, also uh, calculated or estimated that 36% of the treatment of these species are treated by extension, and it, which is more uh, than the the global or the Mediterranean, the global average or uh, the average for other Mediterranean ecosystems, marine or terrestrial ecosystems, for instance. So, wetlands restoration is under the spotlight because all uh, because of all these trends, increasing social and political demand for the restoration and the rehabilitation of these ecosystems. Um, uh, we have we had the the, the target fifteen uh, in twenty twenty two for restoring fifteen percent of the graded uh, ecosystems, which was not achieved at that time. But a new target for twenty thirty has been proposed and uh, and under uh, uh, um, agreement. And we have also financial uh, increase in financial resources available for uh, ecosystem restoration and ecological restoration, restoration in general, and uh, more specifically for wetlands. So let's massively restore wetlands. This is what we can think uh, uh, when we see all the all this uh, this uh, these numbers and figures. However, it's not that simple. And you can imagine that restoring wetlands uh, is is uh, very challenging, specifically when you don't know where to restore. So multiple challenges uh, in order to find ready to restore wetlands. For example, we need to identify where to restore. We need also to identify reversible degradations that could be uh, uh, rehabilitated or, or improved. The, uh, the what is the ecological and conservation relevance and values or added values uh, after the restoration uh, after restoring the wetlands how how to define the governance of the restoration activities political support social accept acceptability technical feasibility and expertise etc so there is need to better match the supply and the demand in order to better find uh, to, 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 to find areas for uh, for wetlands restoration with the, with the high values and relevance so we developed this large scale mapping of potentially restorable wetlands, which is, let's say, one of the, 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 the component of our restoration strategy uh, that we promote at the Mediterranean scale. And this potentially restorable wetlands is based on three main steps. So the first steps is to identify lost Mediterranean wetlands, uh, what, what, what have been lost so far. We, uh, we use, for example, uh, Earth observation data uh, to, to derive several metrics and variables, topographic, hydrology, climatic variables, and we combine them in order to find areas where we have the, 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 the highest probability of wetland occurrence. And this area also 
include areas where we had wetlands in the past and have been totally transformed and drained and transformed uh, in, into other usages. For example, here, uh, uh, Maliki marshes in southern Albania, which was a big lake in the past and was drained in the 50s, 60s, uh, in order to, to develop uh, intensive agriculture, specifically here for sugar beet fields. Here, another example is southern Turkey, the lake of Antioch. Antioch uh, or Amik Lake uh, has, be, has been also drained and transformed in the 60s and the 70s into irrigated crops, but also uh, where we have built uh, an airport uh, in 2007, and this airport is regularly flooded, uh, by the way. And the second step after identifying where we have lost wetlands is the existing wetlands, so where we are now and what is the situation and the status now in order to compare the two situations and find areas to restore. So this is based, the, 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 the current situation is based on the mapping of the land use and land cover at the very large scale. I'll give you here two examples in two uh, large river basins. So the first one on the left, you know it already, is the Cebu River Basin in Morocco. And the second one is the Majerda River Basin between Algeria and, and Tunisia. Uh, so both are in the Maghreb countries. And based on this map, we can identify the wetlands, where are the wetlands, the current situation, and the current status of this wetlands habitat, and what are the main pressures that they, 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 they are facing, specifically uh, urban and uh, uh, agriculture pressures. Then the third step is to combine both. So the lost wetlands or the potentially, uh, pot uh, the, 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 the probability to find wetlands with the existing, the map of existing wetlands. And then we can estimate the needed restoration effort based on the land use and land cover. So based on expert uh, knowledge, we define this uh, five classes uh, of the restoration efforts and we just uh, apply directly these definitions on the current maps. And here is the results. So at the very large scale, we can find areas where restoration of wetlands could be with uh, uh, low effort, moderate effort, high effort or very high efforts. And this is what we have done so far for this uh, two uh, large river basins, and we can extend this work to the, to the entire uh, basin, uh, of course, uh, uh, depending on the availability of, uh, of, of the data, and also the, 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 the accuracy of the data, the, the, the used data, but it provides the first information and first attempt where to, re to, to restore wetlands and how we can estimate the needed efforts for restoration uh, for the restoration of these wetlands with a specially explicit information. So this, of course, it's not sufficient. It's very good to have this information at large scale, but it's not sufficient so far. So there are several. Uh, the, 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 these maps could be used for several purposes. For example, for other regional, the pan-Mediterranean, but also for the national strategies and uh, to advocate for a better restoration of wetlands. Uh, uh, but we need to bring uh, uh, available. We need to bring available funding for restoration actions on the ground, and this is the role of uh, other other strategies or other initiatives that are also promoted by the the Tour de Valar, like for example the green light for the Mediterranean wetlands restoration. So what what could be the next step after these three three first steps? To map, uh, prioritize uh, to map area for to prioritize wetland restoration at large scale. So we can also add other layers to these maps. For example, the biodiversity relevance based on the key biodiversity areas, the protected areas, and also other uh, 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 relevant information to 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 have a better idea where to restore in order to improve the biodiversity uh, status and also to improve the ecological corridors uh, based on this restoration. Uh, uh, activities and uh, uh, to, 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 to have as well this restoration uh, actions and activities as nature-based solution to, 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 to face some, some, some challenges and uh, to address some challenges uh, like, for example, water uh, uh, availability and uh, the, the, the impact of climate change. The other step could be to have the, uh, social, so, uh, the, the social acceptance. So for example, rising awareness, advocate for wetland restoration and, con and, and conservation to build the capacity of the local communities and local stakeholders uh, and also the public, uh, the, the, the public uh, and institutional partners until the restoration is ready to start. So all these steps are really needed to have a successful implementation of restoration actions on the ground. So 
Restoration is a social political practice as much as a scientific and technical one. So thank you for your attention. Many thanks, Anis. I found it very, very interesting and uh, very enlightening, actually, for the way forward. So thank you very much for that. I'll now move immediately to Giuseppe Dodaro. Please, Giuseppe, you take the floor. Okay, thank you very much uh, and for this invitation. It's a great pleasure uh, for me. I hope that uh, you are seeing uh, my screen. Everything is okay. Look, uh, you don't see full screen. If you can put full okay. screen, that's easier. Thank you. Yes, I can again. I try again. Now it's very, okay. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Uh, as can be understood from the title uh, today, I quickly uh, uh, present an app that aims to be a uh, useful uh, citizen science uh, uh, tool that can support scientific research and technical tools. Uh, uh, like uh, that that uh, Anne is uh, shown before in the path of conservation and the restoration of Mediterranean wetland. Uh, the app has been uh, prepared in the framework of the uh, project strengthening, uh, sorry, uh, 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 strengthening uh, the restoration of Mediterranean wetlands for nature and people that found by MAVA Foundation and that was coordinated by uh, WWF Spain. And uh, the app, it can be used uh, with Apple and Android that is uh, now uh, available on Play Store and the Apple Store. Uh, the idea of creating an app uh, specifically dedicated uh, to the wetlands <clears throat> was born uh, from the uh, belief that uh, the um, involvement and the participation of uh, uh, everyone, not only scientists, is necessary for, for the uh, restoration and sustainable management of Mediterranean wetlands. Uh, so uh, everyone, uh, scientists, uh, technicians, uh, nature lovers, but uh, um, also citizens uh, can uh, contribute to the conservation of uh, Mediterranean uh, uh, nature by reporting uh, wetlands uh, that are uh, treated uh, um, in need of restoration. But uh, of course, uh, as, al as always, uh, um, uh, do with uh, these uh, these tools. Uh, the, the app can uh, also use for increasing knowledge and awareness uh, about the importance of uh, wetlands. Um, uh, what we can do, uh, uh, of course, the 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 main objective is to become aware of wetlands that need. Uh, uh, conservation and uh, um, uh, restoration action also for southern uh, uh, treats uh, so as uh, support the work uh, like the ANI's work uh, also with respect to some priorities of conservation uh, but uh, it uh, can clearly use the, uh, by a useful uh, tool for uh, other purposes uh, such as updating and integrating the wetland, uh, the Mediterranean wetland uh, census report, uh, new wetlands that are not yet catalogued. Also, point out species and habitats of uh, uh, particular conservation interest. Uh, and this is also uh, useful to better understand the value of uh, unknown wetland or uh, still uh, uh, little studied wetlands uh, also uh, with defining you know, the conservation uh, um, priorities. Uh, all the people that uh, use the, the app uh, participate by sending uh, their own report and have uh, and they receive feedback uh, by uh, scientists, by experts with some suggestions. And uh, of course, uh, like in uh, all these kind of uh, uh, communities, uh, you can read the reports by other people. You can know uh, some uh, aspect of a wetland that uh, you know. Uh, but also you can uh, discover uh, new wetland uh, 
uh, to do bird watching, to do scientific tourism, uh, and uh, something like that to discover the fantastic uh, nature of uh, Mediterranean. Uh, the uh, functionality is uh, uh, deliberately very simple. Uh, in the picture one, uh, you have to, you, you can uh, start to use the app, uh, click on the uh, black button and uh, after you can have two different type of uh, uh, visualization, uh, the visualization in the uh, picture number two with all the Mediterranean uh, map and uh, you can uh, say some of the, uh, the main wetlands are cataloged or a, a, more specific map like uh, that, that you can see in picture number three uh, with your position, uh, which was my position uh, when I used it last time, the, uh, the app in, uh, in Rome. In both cases, you can move on, uh, on the map. Uh, you can make it bigger or, or smaller to find the wetland uh, that you are interested in and choose the wetland uh, for the name or, or click on the on the position button on the map. Or also uh, it's possible that uh, you have a no map and wetland. So you can choose this, uh, uh, this option and enter, and you enter the name and the description of the, the no map the wetland. Uh, in this example, uh, I, I did this for this small wetland in the very uh, center of Rome, the Lago Bulicante ex Nia uh, small lake. And uh, you can, uh, uh, there is a button and uh, there is a menu. You can uh, choose the, um, type of wetland that you are um, describing and uh, we use the, the categories of the inventory but with some simplification some uh, aggregation does that after... one minute yes yes and after uh, I'm, I'm finishing you can add uh, three uh, photos to better describe your uh, report. Of course, photo are uh, useful uh, to for better verification of the issues and also to increase you know, the engagement of the of, of the people. And uh, um, you can choose one of the treats, and we uh, again uh, use the the. CMP directories classification in the version 2.0 with some simplification. And uh, uh, you can uh, also add some other notes like uh, habitats of species. But if you can ask something about the, um, uh, the, the of, of difficult or specific on uh, uh, nature, uh, issues, uh, the, the system redirect you on uh, uh, specific uh, citizen science uh, uh, sites like uh, iNaturalist and at the end you send the report, the experts uh, check it and uh, validate the, your report and after you can, they, they publicate the report and you can see your, your report on uh, on the app and the visualization of your report. So uh, this is uh, uh, I finished, uh, that's all. Thank you very much. And uh, you can find my email address for any question or classification or clarification, sorry. Thank you very much, Giuseppe, for this very useful uh, explanation on this uh, very practical tool, actually, to, to be used by all those that indeed, for many different reasons, are um, interested, um, even a simple citizen. So we will now move forward to a very important session related indeed to partnership and uh, funding. I mean, all these work, uh, the work that has been presented relies heavily on all this support. So I'm pleased uh, to have the four colleagues with us from different, uh, let's say, organization and program. I will now give immediately the floor to Miss Lea Glatre. Uh, de la Fondation Prince Albert uh, de Monaco. So, Lea, uh, s'il vous plaît, vous êtes là? Yes. Vous avez la parole, parfait. Thank you. 
Okay. Very good. Just put it full screen. Si vous pouvez uh, le mettre. Oui, oui. c'est bon. Okay. Parfait, parfait. Ok. So thank you very much for inviting us uh, to this webinar. So um, I'm Lea Glatt um, and I'm working for the Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation and I'm the coordinator of the Donors Initiative for Mediterranean Freshwater Ecosystems. And um, so first, just as a quick background of on the foundation and our work in this space. Freshwater ecosystems has been a priority topic for the Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation since, in, since its creation in uh, 2006, and especially in the Mediterranean, which is one of the three priority regions of, of the foundation. So the foundation has supported some 20 projects advancing freshwater conservation in the Mediterranean in the past few years. And as a philanthropic donor devoted to environmental protection, we, we aim to support projects with a clear focus on biodiversity and conservation. But um, it has sometimes been challenging to identify projects integrating the protection and conservation of freshwater biodiversity. And there is still a need to ensure that the protection and research of these ecosystems takes its full place at the center of holistic water management. And this is one of the reasons we created uh, in 2021 the Donors Initiative for Mediterranean Freshwater Ecosystems that we can call DIMFI to simplify. So it is an alliance of donors initially created uh, with MAVA Foundation and AG Jensen Charity Foundation. And since then, the Answilsdorf Foundation and the Sigrid Rosing Trust has joined us. So this initiative is dedicated to protect, restore, and conserve freshwater ecosystem in the Mediterranean basin by supporting projects with a strong impact on the ground. Um, so indeed, uh, there is a real gap of funding regarding freshwater ecosystems. As you can see on this graph, uh, it shows how grants of uh, one, uh, 126 foundation, European foundations are distributed across uh, certain team and freshwater uh, freshwater projects are among the least funded with only 16 million granted in 2021 and also in the mediterranean one of the biggest funders devoted to protected uh, biodiversity which is the mother foundation closed in june 2023 leaving an important financing gap in the region so to raise up this challenge, we decided to create a pooled fund through DIMF, which allows us to launch annual calls for projects and to fund bigger projects and a foundation alone could absorb. So for the period 21 to 2027, we have for now a budget of 8.8 .8 million. And since its creation, we launched three calls for projects and we have already engaged 4 million euros, resulting in the support of 11 projects for, throughout the Mediterranean basin. And uh, we also have projects from the South Pole that are still under selection. So to better understand why, what kind of factions DIMF is supporting, I'm going to give you some examples. So for example, in Albania, the project uh, we are supporting a project we, which is lobbying against the construction of an airport within a protected area. Uh, in Croatia, the, the organization that we are supported is, uh, is restoring 10 priority sites in the Croatian Karst uh, Mountains. And uh, we have plenty of other projects, but we also support the Cebu Water Funds that mentioned by, uh, mentioned by Anis just earlier. So these are 
these approaches are all part of the puzzle to enable more effective action in the field. But to make this happen, we really think that collaboration among different stakeholders, such as donors, but also actors in the field, scientists and decision makers is essential. And so collaboration will allow us to scale up our actions and to spread our impact. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lea. And actually, I want to point on uh, indeed your last uh, sentence, meaning indeed that the purpose also of these uh, annual online calls uh, was specifically this. I mean, to gather the different stakeholders and indeed, you know, to promote uh, these uh, opportunities of collaboration around this very important issue. Another um, question that I quickly want to pose to you, when is the uh, next call? When do you expect your next uh, call? Uh, I think it. We haven't fixed that yet, but I think it will be end of August, twenty twenty four. Twenty twenty four. Thank you very much, Lea, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. I will now pass the floor to Vincent Arnoux from um, here. It's written the NECBC Med program, but in fact the program has been renamed, and by now it's uh, the Interreg Next Med program. Vincent, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Alessandra, and uh, I'll try to be as quick as possible. I know that you are under... I'm very sorry for uh, the yeah, time no, no, uh, no management. <laughs> and, uh, well, it's, it's, uh, you're doing a pretty impressive work because moderating such a long session, it's, it's quite uh, tough. So let me, uh, well, I'm sharing the screen, so you will see it in a while. You should be able to see it now. And uh, let's go directly to the, to the point. Uh, most of you know ENICBC MED program, and now indeed we are called Interact Next MED program. The good point is that this uh, conference is uh, happening on the day in which we are probably going to launch the call. If not today, it will be next Monday, but it's it's very, very imminent. So to, remember, to remind you of vision, we have one vision and we have one goal, and it is to contribute to a better Mediterranean and smarter greener and more social this is a global vision yeah I'm, I'm not sure if you see okay now it's done and this is the countries that are participating you know we are working with 15 countries we have two newcomers which are algeria and turkey i'm going very quick because the essential point is a bit further away 103 million available for the first call that is going to be launched today or on monday so a massive amount of money accounting for 45% of our total budget. We finance up to 89% of the costs and we are going to be open to three different types of projects. Thematic, use-oriented, and people that will deliver, especially to the young people and also governance. This is the size of the project, just to give you a, a, very, a very short and uh, first side impression projects that will go from half a million to 2.5 million, depending on the type of project that you are going to submit. And this is the slide that I want to uh, see a bit more in detail with you. Three minutes, uh, not more. And and I want you to, to connect with, of course, with wetlands and with the threats and challenges that Mediterranean wetlands are suffering and what you can do in our program. It is true that we don't have a specific thematic or a specific objective on the protection of the environment. Of course, we do not have a specific objective on wetlands, but still there is room to address the challenges of wetlands in our program. I have no doubt about this. So this is the thematic architecture of the program with four priorities and nine specific objectives. In green, of course, you have the priority on climate change and environment. And I think that if I would um, work for wetlands, I would go for a few of these objectives. Not all of them mm, are connected with you, but I see at least a few, a few of them. First one would be uh, 2.3, which is uh, access to water, water management, and improving water efficiency. Of course, we know that if there are less resources, less water in, uh, in, in, in wetlands, it is 
also or mainly because I'm not an expert, but mainly because of agriculture drainage. So there, if we improve uh, water efficiency and the way water is managed, I'm sure that this will be interesting for you. Also 2.2, where we will address all the risks and consequences of uh, climate change. So catastrophes, but also uh, the impact that climate change can have on, on, on wetlands. Then I see also a big opportunity in 4.1, which is new and which is governance. There we can address the way all the Mediterranean policies or challenges are addressed with the scope of improving the public services, the way they are delivered, and to improve also the relations between citizens and public administrations. And there, the challenge addressed by you could be, of course, the way the wetlands are managed because they are mismanagements and they are poor management. So there is room for improvement there too. And I can I can even see uh, that you could work on 1.2 on the left side of the slide, which is dedicated to business and to SMEs because we, we are a very uh, pragmatical program. And of course, we think that there is no uh, protection of the environment and fight against climate change if we do not integrate the business side and, and the economical side, and especially the SMEs, which are the backbone of the Mediterranean economy. And there, I mean, we have here, uh, very close to Valencia, one of the wetlands, which is Albufera. I know that there is an ecosystem behind. There, there are activities behind, so there are many, um, many SMEs that are linked to it. SMEs or organizations, and I think that uh, improving their competitiveness can also be uh, can also bring many benefits that will make the wetlands more sustainable um, in the future. And of course, the rest maybe it's it's a bit more tricky. We have innovation; still, there is room for it. It also depends on your creativity and your imagination and capacity of project engineering. But I think that with that, I said uh, the most essential, maybe 3.1 also, and that will be my last point, which is dedicated to improving the skills, especially of young people and vulnerable groups, um, skills to, uh, with the final, uh, final objective of improving employability, creating jobs. And I think that as any other uh, sector in life, uh, wetlands are also generating jobs, at least they are associated with jobs. So there is something to train and there is something to improve and raise awareness to it there. And I will finish here, Alessandro, I see you. I know you are going to, to stop me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I stop here. Just a uh, final message, follow us because we are going to launch it today or on Monday. So discover the call and then come back to us for any more information. And I hope that you will find uh, your place and, and room for your challenges, the challenges of the wetlands in our program. Thank you very much for inviting us again, Alessandra. Many thanks to you, Vincent, I mean, uh, for these uh, extremely important inputs. I'm very pleased actually to know that we coincide uh, with the opening of your uh, calls. Of course, they always represent very important opportunities, especially for the uh, Euro Mediterranean countries, also in this logic, you know, of um, you know bringing the Mediterranean together. Uh, your program uh, is one of the main ones supporting actually the Mediterranean as one. So again, based on all what was said, even during the webinar, the opportunity is right there. Thank you very much, Vincent. You're welcome. Thank you. And now I'm pleased to pass the floor to Antonella Utino from Prima. Um, Antonella, the floor is yours. Uh, we have been uh, exchanging over the past years. Prima has been progressively including uh, wetlands. So again, the floor is yours on the past and future opportunities. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Alessandra. Do you see my screen? We can, but if you can put it in full screen, it will be better. Perfect. It's fine like this. So, thank you very much. Then, uh, yes, I want to express my gratitude again to Medwet and uh, and uh, the Union of uh, for the Mediterranean, of course, Alessandra, for inviting Prima today um, uh, in this uh, 
conference. Uh, so I will focus in my presentation on funding opportunities and projects that have been uh, uh, selected that are specifically focusing on context of uh, wetlands. Uh, so a bit of context, uh, Prima uh, is a new partnership, public-public uh, uh, partnership in, uh, at advancing uh, research and innovation and sustainable development in the Mediterranean region. It has been established in 2018 and will operate until 2030. Now we have received very really recently, it's a matter of yesterday, uh, the confirmation of the interinstitutional uh, negotiation that uh, has been uh, positive between the Parliament, the Council, and the Commission. It was very long procedure, and now we have the confirmation that uh, FEMA um, has been granted an extension uh, uh, in uh, in its call till 2027, so it will operate until 2030. Uh, so well, very happy uh, to uh, have the possibility to contribute uh, uh, again with uh, our uh, polls. So, so uh, in fact, uh, we are addressing uh, the, the uh, research we are addressing focusing on uh, challenging agriculture, water resources, and agriculture uh, system. So uh, our mission is uh, to foster collaboration among Mediterranean countries uh, to further food security, water scarcity, and the environmental sustainability issues through research and innovation. And um, recently, we have shifted our focus also towards the ecosystem to our wealthy and access approach. Um, and uh, for instance, uh, uh, with projects like uh, um, for the use uh, and uh, uh, also MedWet uh, project that have been funded uh, respectively in 2018 and 2020. Uh, we are, in fact, uh, those projects use uh, con constructed wetlands to convert uh, wastewater into reclaimed irrigation water. And this project highlights uh, the significant benefits of wetlands uh, in water resource management. But then in 2021, uh, we have also the uh, very uh, good example of the Marine Mediterra project. Um, which uh, contributed to wetland restoration uh, in Turkey uh, and introducing an innovative floating wetlands in Greece, uh, uh, show, uh, showcasing uh, uh, echoing out the wetland aquaponic system, so uh, in, emphasizing the versatility of, uh, of, of wetlands. And um, in, uh, more recently, in 2022, we have selected two projects with uh, 8 million euro budget. Uh, the net map, for instance, the net map uh, uh, project, uh, um, which focuses on each of the solution for the water cycle. And uh, while um, I would like to put attention on uh, this project, which is called uh, our map, uh, which seeks uh, uh, equitable water management solutions, uh, moving away from a single sector approach. Uh, so, um, our MED uh, project is actively researching water uh, discoloration in the Albuquerque Lagoon in Spain, uh, the one which um, Vincent uh, had referred to, uh, addressing the impacts of heat waves in agriculture. So, uh, this, uh, this project now is currently investigating on the causes behind uh, the recently and suddenly observed brownification of the Albuquerque Lagoon, uh, which is one uh, of the project uh, uh, demo sites. So uh, a bit more recently, again, in 2023, uh, we have selected the project uh, that are in fact aligned with the, the EN objective of the U-Mission. We have drafted this, uh, this topic with the U-Mission Restore and Ocean and Waters. Um, and uh, those two projects have been selected now recently we have uh, uh, announced uh, the, the funding of the project CIRPA and the project uh, SPORMED. Um, the wild CIRPA uh, focus on advanced methods for water uh, use and sustainable soil fertilization using recoverable water nutrients, using integrating uh, contrast constructed wetlands again. Uh, the SPORMED uh, aims uh, to develop sustainable wastewater 
uh, treatment facilities in uh, the Mediterranean, also with constructed wetlands, as a central huge feature. So uh, again, on 2023, we are focusing on uh, constructed wetlands. Uh, so this project illustrates, in fact, how uh, uh, constructed wetlands uh, contribute uh, to the environmental uh, restoration and uh, sustainable uh, resource management uh, aligning with the objective of the mission um, of the EU mission restored our uh, ocean and um, And last information that I would like to uh, provide is that also we are very close to the announcement of the report uh, for PRIMA, which is uh, the, the report 2024. Uh, those calls will be open in January, and uh, the, but the annual plan uh, with the description of the topics. Uh, uh, will be already available by the end uh, of this year. So have an eye, we are going to, of course, to uh, provide this information to our social, uh, but I think uh, you, you, you could have really um, uh, have an eye on what is happening on Prima for the next uh, uh, call. And uh, um, lastly, uh, as I was saying before, uh, we just have the confirmation of our extension, so our calls will continue uh, till until 2027, um, and uh, so we'll be able to contribute again uh, for the Prima uh, pro program, um, uh, aligning more and more uh, to ecosystem and to the objective of the Ukraine deal and uh, the UFM in the region. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Antonella. I'm really happy actually to move towards the end of this webinar with this great news, also with extension of uh, Prima. Uh, again, a very important uh, program uh, for this uh, Euro-Mediterranean uh, cooperation. And many thanks also for integrating progressively more this uh, environmental component in the program itself and indeed the uh, wetlands in the specific uh, case uh, uh, in point. Of course, I mean, the Green Deal had also is uh, influence on all these and very importantly, also the partnership with the uh, uh, with other mission risks or uh, our oceans and seas. So thank you very much. Uh, we look forward actually to these opportunities to be exploited by all those that are with us today. Let me now move towards uh, the last uh, presentation of this session, which is the one from Annalise Brockman from CREAF, very dear colleague we just met actually a few weeks uh, ago. I'd like actually to um, differentiate maybe this uh, presentation from the previous in the sense that uh, uh, Annalise will focus on one of the mission of the Interreg Euromed uh, program related to the governance projects, uh, which are already in place and that, among others, foresee the possibility of, for the countries of the South to join uh, as uh, associates. So the mission nature, which Annalise will be presenting, is indeed uh, as started, we run up to 27, 28, and indeed representing itself already an ongoing opportunity of collaboration. Annalise, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Alessandra, for this uh, introduction and for this invitation. I hope you can see the screen correctly. We do, it's perfect. Fantastic. So uh, just to directly go into the matter, uh, our mission is to protect, restore and valorize natural heritage all along in the Mediterranean. And in specific, uh, I would like to speak about uh, the opportunities for wetlands in this realm. So our objective is to establish a community of practice, including both shores, all shores of the, of the Mediterranean, and to uh, um, conduct this relationship until the end to the project, which is seven years. So uh, we will end 2029. And by the end of the project, we would like to formalize this community of practice into a Mediterranean resilience network. Uh, this wants to enhance the coordination between uh, multi-level stakeholders, programs, strategies, and initiatives all along the Mediterranean in order to tackle specific topics on environmental restoration uh, by mainstreaming transferable results from the Interreg Euromed program the thematic projects into 
effective strategies and practices, and of course, mainstream into policies in all these different realities. So the objective of transferring um, these solutions will be uh, organized by meeting, meeting people from different perspectives. From one side, we have the consortia of the uh, Community for Nature and Dialogue for Nature projects, which, which compose the mission itself, together with uh, different thematic projects that are promoted under the, the upcoming call, the present and upcoming calls of Interregno Romain, and uh, associated partners. And also it's open to other stakeholders who might be interested in collaborating towards the objective. So just we are starting, we had the first year and already from the start, we have more than 100 organizations. So we really hope that by the end of the project, this uh, community will be rich, diverse and engaged and committed towards this huge uh, challenge to improve the, uh, the conservation and valorization of our natural heritage. Uh, the thematical projects are the key, are the, are the soul of the generation of these solutions to be transferred. And we can announce that recently, very recently, we got the first uh, group of thematic projects that were approved by the program, uh, 13 to be precise, and we selected today two uh, because they are dealing with wetlands. So we would like to share that these projects are going to be implemented in the upcoming three years. Um, one of them is called Wetlands Solutions for Change. It's a test project where five pilot sites in different countries will be developed in order to boost the actions to enhance carbon sequestration and flood regulation, engaging uh, science, engaging users, engaging stakeholders, and trying to build this transnational hub for wetland climate solutions. We also have a transfer project, it's called Wetland Governance Through Community of Practice, uh, which presents or, or tries to, um, let's say, upscale an already consolidated um, experience of the wetland contracts, which is a governance tool uh, that tries to um, foster the coordination between organizations and try to exchange experiences, methodologies, and transfer uh, best solutions all through the Euromed region. Um, these two projects will be the first step towards uh, our activities on wetlands, and uh, we hope they will be fruitful for exchanges, for knowledge, knowledge sharing. And in order to do so, we really are trying to build up a catalog of solutions for foster, uh, to, as a basis for this transference. But we will uh, put into practice this transfer through a portfolio of services, uh, which ranges really uh, towards a lot of teams and a lot of partners and a lot of specific uh, activities tailored to the needs of the participants. Uh, as a first step, we created four overall thematic working groups. You can see the titles here. And these are uh, underpinned by a forum you can find in our website. Uh, if you log in, you will see each of these groups are presented and you're invited very warmly to have a look, to participate, to present yourself in this forum in order to foster a first contact and to explore if and how you would like to be engaged in these activities. The objectives are diverse. For example, we would like to uh, develop policy papers based on your experience, based on the lessons learned in order to tackle and uh, influence directly uh, different policy arenas in the EU, in the Mediterranean realm and international uh, level. 
um, furthermore, there will be this. This working groups are the are the first umbrella, but there are many uh, different aspects in this portfolio of services that we want to offer to all of you, uh, such as, for example, mentorship programs to foster capacity building and trans and 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 capacity on 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 transference itself. It's not easy. Uh, to uh, adopt solutions that were successful in one place and to make them successful in totally a different setting. So we will boost uh, the knowledge on transference, good practices on how to upscale and disseminate good proposals. We will foster multi-actor platforms in order to uh, have uh, a boost in synergetic cooperation between territories and between sectors. No? Uh, so we can really dive into the details with the expert uh, advice and share also this expertise and lessons learned through the Interreg Euromed Academy, which is an online acad academy. And also it has face-to-face -face events such as summer schools or specific educational days or knowledge, knowledge exchange uh, events. Um, just recently, we came back from Slovenia, where we had our first annual institutional dialogue event, where we met a whole, uh, whole set of stakeholders and also representatives of the different programs linked and, uh, to the Interreg Euromedrial. And as an example of putting the ideas into practice, this year we had an awareness raising campaign on coastal erosion, which I heard from previous speakers that is a key a worrying aspect all along the Mediterranean shores. Um, I thank you very much for this first uh, opportunity to, to present ourselves and to stick into the time. Please come uh, contact us in all these different means in order to link up to the project and to build our community together. Many thanks, Annalise, for showing all the wide areas of possibilities. Indeed, that there is our collaboration, and uh, yes, of course, also the just approved thematic uh, projects, the community of practice. You referred also to coastal erosion. Let me remind you what I said at the very beginning that uh, you know Medec is about to release uh, the specific technical report on coastal erosion. So I mean, it's important also to refer to that as very solid also scientific basis to work on all together. So thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much to all. I'd like now to close uh, the session related part. We are about to close uh, the event. We know that there have been uh, some requests for the floor. Unfortunately, we are not able to use, uh, uh, you know, this uh, direct uh, tool. We would like and wish you to write any question on the chat and if so in the very next uh, uh, minute but if not we remain available to reply any of your question to put you in contact with the colleagues and speakers you wish uh, to um, follow up with and uh, with this last word i thank you for your participation on behalf of the union for the mediterranean and I give the floor to my other colleague, Federic de Deneshen, for also uh, his inputs and uh, final remarks. Thank you very much to everybody. Federic, are you... Grazie, Alessandra. Can you hear me? We can. We can hear okay, you. Okay, good. Um, three points. First, congrats to the team, the UFM and, and uh, WebMed team for, for this, this fascinating workshop. This is my first participation, and really... I followed from the beginning to the end and, and the presentations were really outstanding. So thank you to, to the panelists. They have taken us through a, a journey uh, through many different countries, many different topics and at uh, all levels, regional, national and local. It was really fascinating. Um, I'm back from COP28 where uh, we met with uh, Razan Al-Bubarak. Uh, you may have heard of her. She's the COP... 28 climate champion. She brings in the non-state actors in the process. She's also the president of IUCN, where the Ramsar uh, Secretariat is uh, co-hosted, uh, co-located. And, and she has put nature, including uh, wetlands, at the center of the COP. And there was one day dedicated to nature, land use, and, uh, and ocean. And, and 
during that day, a lot of money was raised for, for nature. And I think that's really important. And we also discussed with her a certain number of, of nature and ocean breakthrough initiatives that will be launched following the COP28. And, and definitely wetlands are at the core of, of, of these initiatives. So this is very good news. And I think uh, that uh, as final conclusion, I would like to thank the 80 plus participants. This is quite outstanding to have um, 80 plus participants during two hours uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a workshop, in a webinar. And I think that it shows that when we join our forces, when we unite, we can make a huge difference. And uh, especially on our way to COP20, COP15 uh, Ramsar in, in Zimbabwe. So thank you very much. And uh, looking forward to uh, continue working on this very important topic. Many thanks, uh, Federico, also for your contribution and the testimony also from the water, uh, let's say, team, which we are all part of. And many special thanks uh, on this occasion also to Ellen for having uh, supported us throughout this uh, uh, webinar, but also over the past uh, months. Special thanks to you, Ellen, from us, but of course also from the MedWet team and from all the participants. So with this, we close the event and looking forward to the next opportunity to gather all together. Bye. Thank you very much, Alessandra. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much for my end. Thank you, Alessandra. Thank you, everyone. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much.